Hey there! My name is Azariah, and I chose to do my thesis topic on manipulation of the human genome with a focus on eradicating genetic illnesses. I chose to do this topic because, almost exactly two years ago to this day, I was forced to withdraw from school due to my own genetic illness, and I was curious about the implications of potentially curing it. My thesis sought to answer the question, should we artificially manipulate the human genome with the intent to eradicate genetic illnesses? At the end of my research, I had reached the conclusion that, although such efforts could provide many valuable benefits to both individuals and humanity at large, the legal, economic, medical, and ethical drawbacks are so significant that America should not allow the genetic manipulation of the human genome. Before I proceed with my presentation, I would like to clarify the difference between a gene and a genome. A gene is a segment of DNA that contains the instructions to build a single protein. A genome is the sum total of an organism's DNA. During my research, I focused on the medical, legal, economic, and ethical implications of genetic manipulation of the human genome, in addition to looking at it from a Christian worldview. I don't have time to present all my research, but clearly the strongest argument for the use of genetic manipulation is the potential for a cure. Scientists can use technologies like CRISPR, which is basically a pair of enzymatic scissors that scientists use to cut DNA out of a gene. In Mendelian disorders, where only one gene is affected, CRISPR allows scientists to enter a cell, find the mutated DNA, cut it out of the genome, and replace it with non-mutated DNA. Scientists are also excited by the tantalizing possibility of a future in which they could create a universal immunity to all natural viruses. Finally, CRISPR is more accurate than any prior technology and works on a larger scale. Yet there are several drawbacks to this medical utopia. The first flaw is that in a world with the universal immunity due to the nature of such an immunity, biohackers could synthesize new diseases that we would be totally defenseless to, and our antibiotics would not work with our systems. Secondly, CRISPR may be more accurate than prior technology, but that doesn't mean it is accurate enough to be used. Finally, scientists don't understand all the downstream effects of unleashing altered organisms into the wild, including the human gene pool. We don't even know what all of the genes in the human genome do, we should wait to change any of them, if we ever do, at least until we know how they all work as a unit and how environment plays a role in their expression. From a legal perspective, genetic manipulation is perfectly permissible, with certain caveats. The biggest restriction has to do with limiting federally funded research on embryos to 21 cell lines that have consent forms filed, and the National Institutes of Health for itself forbids CRISPR from being used on human embryos with public funding. As of July 2016, however, there were no U.S. laws governing the type of research done on human embryos with private money. Yet there are several recommendations used to help form policy about what should be in a consent form. The biggest problem with genetic manipulation is that it requires research, and legally the only research that can be done involves these 21 embryos. And yet all of the consent forms used to obtain those embryos are invalid for one reason or another. Economically, CRISPR is cheaper than any technology before it, and is more efficient. In addition, many people view germline manipulation, manipulation of reproductive cells that will pass on the altered DNA to future generations, as an investment in the nation's children. Finally, the drug therapies and other discoveries will result in a new boom in the medical industry. Yet, just because things are cheaper than they were does not mean that they are cheap. The Human Genome Project, right, a project began in 2016 to artificially create an entire human genome from scratch, could cost over $1 billion, and it might be federally funded. In addition, Dr. Francis Collins, director of the National Institutes of Health, says that 
whole genome synthesis extends far beyond current scientific capabilities. So HGP right is a total waste of money. Ethically, a lot of scientists are simply trying to make people healthier. They are trying to alleviate suffering, which is a noble goal. It really is. Yet there is a massive problem with embryonic research, which I do not have time to discuss here, but I would be happy to discuss later. In addition, there's a massive divide between what scientists know and what the public knows, which is, in some cases, intentional. The first HGP right meeting was intentionally kept secret. Finally, there's the question of eugenics. Historically, eugenics has covered everything from selective breeding to the Nazi extermination program on the basis of ethnicity to the basis of disability. With the power of CRISPR and genetic modification, it's easier than ever to enact eugenics. People have dreamed of creating designer babies to fit their parents' wishes, from athletic ability to eye color to gender, and most commercial IVF clinics have the microscopes required to use CRISPR on embryos. This easily leads down a path towards horrors we wish were unfamiliar. Yet Christians can disagree on this topic. Romans 8, 20 through 21 says humans are subjected to decay. While Christians know that perfection will not be attainable until Christ comes again in his full glory, Many believe that the alleviation of genetic diseases is consistent with God's redemptive purposes. After all, if the alleviation of smallpox was a blessing, then wiping out cystic fibrosis or Huntington or AIDS would be too. Yet Romans 9.20 says, Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, Why did you make me like this? Some Christians argue that genetic manipulation represents tampering with human nature ordained by God. Many of these Christians are actually people who have genetic illnesses. Finally, the founder of IVF said, Soon it will be a sin of parents to have a child that carries the heavy burden of genetic disease. We are entering a world in which we must consider the quality of our children. Will, one day, parents who want to have children naturally be considered abusers or neglectful? That is a line that cannot be crossed. At the heart of a Christian worldview, we value people not on their quality, their intelligence, appearance, achievements, or health, but rather based on their creation in the image of God. After completing my research, I interned under a person whose name I am retracting, and whose title I am also retracting, who works at the National Institutes of Health. Most of my two-week internship was spent in his lab, working under him and alongside four of his underlings to study the effects of removing the gene that codes for transcobalamin, a receptor for vitamin B12 from zebrafish, in an attempt to discern how much of the development of spina bifida and other neural tube defects is genetic and how much is environmental. I read more sources for my thesis, participated in experiments, and even stopped a fire. I was privileged enough to attend the 5th Annual Genomics and Society Work Group meeting. I was incredibly blessed to work under my mentor and alongside this specific group of people, as well as to encounter everyone else who I spoke with, as I encountered a unique blend of actual genetic manipulation, though not of people, and ethics that truly shed light onto my thesis topic. One question that I asked a staff scientist I worked with who had written her doctorate paper on this topic was about the difference between somatic cell and germline manipulation. Somatic cells are non-reproductive cells, such as a liver cell, and germline cells are reproductive cells that will pass on changes to future generations. This co-worker seemed to think that we as a society shouldn't participate in germline manipulation at all, because future generations can't consent to current procedures. She seemed less adamant about somatic cell manipulation in theory, but was very clear that now is not the time. We as a society are not ready. In my interview with my mentor, he cited the fact that a lot of people are concerned with what counts as a disease. If we do somatic cell manipulation, then decide what we erase was something we want back, we only have to wait a generation but that's not true with germline manipulation. I also asked a post-baccalaureate fellow I worked with if she thought the general 
lack of scientific literacy might be an issue in the conversation. She wholeheartedly agreed, saying that especially in such a complex topic, it is important for people to understand what they're discussing. I mentioned this in my interview with my mentor, and he agreed. He said it allows us to have a baseline for real conversation. Internships are designed to show how complex the real world is instead of cut and dry theory, and my internship did that. I felt myself constantly oscillating between the two sides of the argument. Every time I landed in support of my thesis, all I had to do was Google a genetic disease, and my theoretical decision to condemn people to such suffering filled me with tremendous guilt. So I would consider switching my stance, and the fear of eugenics would creep in the back of my mind, along with worries about Christian stewardship. How can we justify this extravagance when there are far cheaper cures that would help many more people? Despite my thesis topic and my practical experience in my internship, I'm no scientist. I'm much more of a philosopher, and so these are philosophical concerns, but they have eaten at me so strongly over these past two weeks, and really the whole time I wrote my paper, that I find myself unable to pick a side. America is going to proceed with the manipulation of the human genome at some point, and I think that's wrong. But it would be wrong not to do so, too. Thank you for listening.